I get often asked when I am interviewed for a variety of things, like, what, what happened? How did you cope? What happened next? Because obviously, just because the perpetrator is out of your life, and unfortunately, mine was on to his next victim, unbeknownst to all of us, you are left with the trauma of what happened to you. And you don't have any idea at age 16 what is supposed to happen next and how you're supposed to be able to move on with life and be able to be 100% all in. And because I have that kind of a personality, um, once I knew that the story I had been told was not true, that I was not, you know, in the middle of trying to save a dying planet, that I didn't have some special mission, there was a period of time of real um, guilt that I went through, the guilt of and the shame of what was, you know, done to me. But it felt as if I had been, you know, willing because I was probably in the middle of doing one of the most important things that could ever happen for another planet. So when that wasn't true, there was this grieving period that I went through just, I think, partly because I didn't feel special and because I had lost a person who was my perpetrator, but who I had been completely devoted to, was with him all the time that I could possibly be, and that these very, um, you know, even though it was icky, even though it was not pleasant, it was still like some kind of connection to a, to a higher purpose, if you will, that I had to let go of because it wasn't real and try to figure out who I was. And so there was a real grieving process in that. Um, so if you think about the stages of grief, which we can talk about in more detail, the first thing is that that realization, um, the realization and knowing it wasn't true, the very, very first night after I got home from that date, first dance I'd ever been to with a boy, got home, nobody's dead, nobody's blind, nobody's missing. I remember after talking to my dad for just a few minutes, and it, that was like a brand new experience because I hadn't been allowed to have a conversation or to have him even touch me was like against the rules. And because I was trying to protect him, that's how my life had been for those last few years. And yet I had grown up with a very loving father, um, very affectionate, um, a father who gave us, you know, lots of compliments and encouragement and lots and lots of love, unconditional love from both of my parents. So to be able to sit on the arm of his lazy boy chair and talk to him about the date, and for the first time in almost, what, three, four years, I, I, leaned, I leaned into him and gave him a little kiss on the forehead. It was kind of like the final button on if something doesn't strike like lightning or I'm not starting to steam from the inside out and being vaporized. I'm pretty sure this isn't true. This wasn't actually real. And when something has been incredibly real to you, any kind of a belief system, and then you have what a lot of people call their crisis of faith or their, they're coming into a new decision about what they think and what they know to be true. And it's very uncomfortable. You feel very alone in the world once again. And I felt very much like an alien for those, those four years. I felt it. I looked like it to me because I still hadn't developed, you know, I didn't look like the other girls in gym class and in the shower. Um, I was still very much a, a, a child, um, in a, an, an older person in a child's body because I'd been through a lot. And sitting there with my dad and just that last little piece of the puzzle, that little kiss on his forehead and how he reacted like, oh, like he knew that I was coming back because it had been so different and coming back to how our relationship had been and how it would be again. And as I walked down the hallway, didn't go downstairs anymore, had not been in my bedroom down there for a number of months by this point, back into the office where they had put a bed so I could sleep upstairs. Um, 
I just laid on the bed, fully clothed in my gunny sack uh, dress, you know, and my platform um, shoes, you know. And I laid there just staring up at the ceiling, trying to figure out who am I and what happens next? How do I, do I, do I tell somebody? I, I was just, it was just really a, a confusing, um, many conflicted feelings. There's a, there's a feeling of loss. There was a feeling of true grief. Like I missed out on these, these years, you know, as a normal tween, you know, as a, as a 12 to, to 14 year old and then a 14 to 16 year old, those are big, those are big times in the development of a young person. And you're supposed to experience a lot of things that are going to inform how you'll be a 17 and 18 and a young adult. And so as I laid there staring at the ceiling, not really knowing, almost numb, and yet with all these confused thoughts and emotions kind of surging through my body. There was a feeling of relief. There was a feeling of fear. What if I'm wrong? What if I misinterpreted that I got away with this and then tomorrow they're coming (laughs) to vaporize me and take Susan and Karen will be blind and mom and dad will be dead, you know. Just, Just still lots of fear and lots of grief. So I think when somebody is is done with you know the the brainwashing piece what has to happen is a ton of rehabilitation into the real world right and these are things that i get asked but rarely do people go into detail about what it actually feels like when the abuse is over when the brainwashing is over but the lingering effects of all of the various pains and grief that you come to realize. So there was definitely a sudden realization because of what I had just done that that it was probably not real because I had never been to a dance with a boy. I had never, you know, I hadn't really had any significant relationship with my father for those years. Nothing. I mean, you know, hello, goodbye. Help me with this, you know, school problem maybe once in a while, but just really I ignored him. Um, And just all of a sudden didn't hug him and, you know, all those things. So that was a sudden change in in my life and a welcome change. Um, But to grasp the full, the full measure of what it would mean to not be that special person on a special mission to save a dying planet was pretty intense. And it didn't happen overnight. It felt as if somebody, well, like anybody in a maybe a, a relationship with somebody that then does something that completely destroys your faith and trust in them. It felt like that. It was like someone that I had completely believed in and had been in this in this special, you know, quest together all of a sudden was a liar a fake a phony and where that left me was feeling like am I just stupid am I just unimportant why would he he do that to me why would anyone do that to a 12 year old and yet not having enough of the developmental experiences through those years to really be able to put it together like like oh I could just get really mad and go after this guy nothing like that was in my brain or my head at all it was more this disappointment this deep loss of a person that I had trusted that I had believed in that I had been in in cahoots with in accomplishing something that I thought was super spectacular So if you could look inside of my head, what I would tell you is that what I could remember throughout that, that next about two to three years, actually, was just a constant feeling of, I'm not worth it. I'm definitely not smart enough. I'm definitely not coherent enough. 
I definitely don't know the difference between truth and lies. And that was huge for me because I'd grown up with such a strong core belief system that I would know what was true, that, you know, somehow I would be guided by that inner spirit that would tell me this is true and this is false. And so to have that completely um, challenged, because obviously what I was feeling and experiencing was absolutely the opposite. Like, I have no idea what's true and what's false and what's fake and what's real and what's not real. That is a really important piece that anybody who is dealing with overcoming some kind of, of, you know, where they've been manipulated, whether you've been in a domestic violent um, kind of situation or not even violent, but maybe just a domestic um, emotionally and mentally charged um, situation, you really don't get out of that without questioning, who am I really? That's the very first piece. Who am I really? And will I ever be able to trust myself again or anything that I believe in ever again? Now, because I had been raised with these really deep core values, you know, basic commandments, basic ways to live your life, you know, service, being kind, um, loving people, you know, forgiveness, all of these core beliefs and values were the things that I also fell back on and they gave me a guidance, a pathway to be back in that pathway. So another thing that can happen, which happened to me, was that I became sort of hyper um, valiant and religious. I was very much like, here's the checklist of everything to do right. And if I do, things like this could never happen to me again because I will know. That was what I leaned on. That was what I went back to because it was not only was it familiar, but it was all around me. You know, I had parents who lived what they believed. You know, we we didn't just go to church on Sunday. You know, we were out doing service projects and, and inviting, you know, the the poor and the needy and the outcasts and those that needed extra love and extra help to the house for dinners and for gatherings. You know, we just, I don't know, we were just a very, um, we were a friendly bunch of people. And that did not, that did not cease, even though we had been through this horrific experience. So I go back to when I was in the basement. This was after I knew, or I thought I knew, or I hoped it wasn't true on one on one level and Caroline and Karen we were having a sleepover and they started asking me questions like what happened well what did he do well how did he do that and I started to slowly talk about some of the things that I had been through and as we got deeper into the conversation I I know that I had some kind of a what I would call sort of a fugue state where I don't remember exactly what happened, but my sister Karen said that for her, it was one of the scariest things that she's ever experienced or seen. And I do remember the color of the carpet and clawing at the carpet. I do remember being on the floor and just like scraping that shag carpet, you know, it just kept scraping it and scraping it as I was trying to tell them what, kind of had happened. It was a lot of information to try to share, but they were relentless, especially Caroline. She just kept asking questions. She was just like, we are getting the truth out of her. And so as we, as, as I continued to do that and clawed at the floor and, and just shaking and crying and, and gasping for air, and my sister Karen can tell the story a little better than I can because a lot of it I don't quite remember. But I do remember that part. I do remember clawing at the carpet and being on the floor in the color of the green shag carpet. So that I remember. And um, it was just one of those, those like where you just let everything out. There's so many emotions and there's so much that has been hidden and been a secret and been, and been pushed down and pushed aside and, and ignored in your emotional self that it just comes flowing out just like, you know, like a scene from The Exorcist. <laughs> That's the only thing I can compare it to. I remember I, I, as a kid, as a young person, I never watched 
any of those kind of scary movies. But in my more adult life, as I've acted in a number of, you know, scary horror films, I've watched more horror. And I remember watching something along the lines of an Exorcist movie. Maybe it really was the Carrie movie or something. And I just thought, oh, that's me. <laughs> that looks like that looks like how I think I must have looked or felt. Um, and, it, you know, it's like if you can be the person in someone's life that can sit through that initial experience of someone disclosing and divulging all of their emotional, um, you know, heartbreak and, 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 and the scared, scared person that is just trying to throw everything out of their system. You know, it's a real gift that you can give to someone like me, <laughs> as my best friend Caroline and my sister Karen did for me. Sorry, um, it makes me emotional because that to me is like the beginning of healing. I think it's almost impossible to keep your secrets of sexual abuse and assault and rape to yourself and think that eventually it will not catch up with you and affect your life and that you really do have to deal with it. And step one is you have to talk about it. So that's a real gift. If you can listen to someone and let them go through that beginning process, which is telling someone about your grief telling someone about your pain and not feeling like you're completely alone. That is like the first piece of what happened for me right after I, I realized and knew that it really wasn't true. And so telling, telling those two led me to telling the next two, which were my parents, because basically I was threatened. If you don't tell mom and dad, if you don't go upstairs and tell your parents, we're going to go tell them. And I didn't want that. And so exhausted having been up all night. Um, but also with the, the beginning feeling of just being a little bit freed up, a little tiny bit, not completely freed up. That did not happen for a long time. But, but being freed up enough that I could at least tell the most important people in my life that I, I was positive, you know, loved me because of the way they treated me all through this time. You know, I, I look at my father and how awful I was to him um, trying to follow all the rules, and yet he would never respond with anger. He would only respond with, I don't know what's wrong, dear Jenny, or hey, precious jewel, or my sweet, you know, um, doll of sweet. You know, those were the expressions my dad would say to all of his girls, you know. You're a precious jewel. You're a doll of sweet. You're a woman of destiny. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong, but I know you're a woman of destiny. And um, I just want you to know that I love you and I'm here. And because I heard that every day, even on all those days that I was not talking, I was not affectionate, I was, you know, screaming at my parents and staging, you know, fights so that it would make sense that I had been a runaway, you know, on that second kidnapping. I look back and I just think, wow, that is, I'm so lucky. That is a gift that many, many people I know do not get. They do not have parents who unconditionally respond with love and empathy and the knowledge that I know how wonderful you are. I know how important you are. I am here for you when you're ready to tell me, talk to me, Give me a chance to be back in your life. Really an amazing, an amazing thing that happened outside on the, on the patio when I went upstairs to tell my mom and dad. And they didn't pressure me. They, didn't, they were not like my sister and my friend Caroline. <laughs> they just sat there and listened and tears rolled down their faces. That's what I remember. And any time that I would get close to trying to talk about you know, the abuse or that sexual part of it, I couldn't say the words. I absolutely could not. I didn't know if I even had the words. I, I didn't look at it that way. I just looked at it as if I was, I had done something wrong and they never pressured me. I would just say, oh, there was icky stuff, but I don't want to talk about that. 
So I think that's an interesting piece also that you you could have either experience where someone's really pressured you to talk, which is could be a good thing. At least for me, that pressure of um, of talking about it helped me get it out. I but I was ready. I was already pretty sure it wasn't real because that dance night had gone as it did. But I still was scared. What if I'm wrong? You know, I don't know where B is right now, but I haven't heard from him for a little while. But I could be wrong. Maybe because I'm still an alien, you know, because I still looked like one to myself. My mother was sewing little padded bras for me by that point. About about age 14, actually, when I got back um, from the second kidnapping when I was found and brought home. It was shortly after that in the new school, in the new year, um, that I asked my mom if she could please just take a, a, a bra and, pu- and put stuffing, like pillow stuffing in it so that I could look more normal around the other girls at school. And, and she did. <laughs> so, um, you know, those are just little details of how, how you feel so, so different. How abuse and secrets that are painful make you feel as if you are a weirdo. I'm not an alien anymore, but I'm still a weirdo. I'm still, you know, somebody that doesn't know what is true, what is false. I'm someone that is constantly second-guessing myself. I'm smart in school. That's the one place where I really excelled. It was a safe place to do, you know, to do well in school. For me, that kept my, you know, spirits up because I could get good grades and I would still be doing drama, which was huge for me. If I had not been involved in the arts as a little girl, and then through those years when we met the Birch Told family, and then after and in between both kidnappings and in high school, it would have been much harder. That's all I can say, is that the arts truly saved my life. And I have been a proponent of of always, you know, having your young person involved in the things that give them, you know, joy and and bring, you know, a sense of accomplishment and a spirit of teamwork and all of those things that I happen to exceed to succeed and to excel in acting and musical theater was what we did a lot of in high school and I won a lot of drama competitions and and the Irene Ryan award and I got to do some pretty amazing things in in those competitions and one of the other, the, this is what I wanted to talk about in, in ending this little piece. One of the things that I did, and this was when I was a junior, was I took the, I had seen the um, television show, Sybil. Um, or no, I had read the book first. And then I think the television show came out later with Sally Field. I think I had read the book. And I wrote my own monologue. It was a nine-minute monologue. And I used five or six of the personalities from the book, um, Sybil. And I won every competition. And it was one of the most cathartic things I ever did because the main feelings that I know grief entails, and I can't think of the order right now, but the, the five personalities that I displayed throughout, you know, just being this young girl or woman, this young woman who was now talking about to her therapist what um, she had been through and she kept switching personalities, allowed me to feel the five things that I was always trying to not feel. (laughs) And it was such a cathartic experience because I took excerpts throughout the book and I just wrote my own monologue for this drama competition. And it was rage. It was deep, deep, grief and sadness. It was giddy, teenage, tween age kind of joy. It was power. 
the power of I'm going to take care of you, that power, that was the fourth one. And the fifth one was just a sense of normalcy, of belonging. And so when I did that and, you know, won everything through this competition, it really, performing that really allowed me to kind of grieve some of those feelings and to have some of the feelings that I wanted to have in my post-brainwashed state, but really didn't know how. It was very difficult for me to access what I would call real um, confidence and joy. I really had lost that. But those emotions that I could demonstrate through these five characters that I used in this monologue um, from her personality. Um, I know it's called something else today, dis- disassociation identity disorder, I believe. Um, but back in, in that time, it was called multiple personality disorder. It allowed me to feel things that I actually believe moved my healing process forward in an accelerated way. So by the time I graduated from high school, I was the senior class president my senior year. I should be planning a reunion for 2025. Wow, I've been, I've been gone from high school for a minute. <laughs> um, so I had gotten involved in student government. I was, of course, involved in drama. All of the activities of school and church and my, you know, many, many uh, friends and friendships that was where I spent the majority of my time. And then every summer doing the summer musicals and the summer right after my senior year, I went and did my first, um, my first summer stock experience at West Yellowstone at the Playmill Theater. And all of those things that I had been involved in actually were very, very much a first step on what I believe my healing journey needed so that I could, I could continue to dig deeper into other areas. But these were things that allowed me to feel the feelings that I had been denied feeling for all of those years in my childhood. So um, the struggles for me were mostly right after were just that sense of belonging. Like I was weird. I was different. I, I didn't have the confidence. And even though I was doing all of these things and winning drama competitions, I still didn't have any confidence. I didn't have any confidence in my looks. I didn't have any confidence in my talents. I always thought somebody else was better than me. Um, And the interesting thing is, is that for those couple of years, I didn't really hear from B. I heard from him maybe the summer after, right after my 16th birthday. And... And it was in uh, from a, a note, again, that I would get these notes from people at school. And it was basically like, I don't know what you're thinking now. It was kind of like something like this. I don't know what you're thinking now. And if you know, but I am still the person that will take care of you and that will love you forever. Kind of like that forever be. And I would get these little books, these little, I'll, I'll have to bring one into our podcast and on camera, I'll have to show you. They were very popular back in, in the mid to late 70s. And um, these little love stories with these little characters that look like kind of like holly hobbies. And so I would get, I still would get once in a while something, but I just ignored it because I, by the time I was a senior, I, I knew I was still looking under my car and behind my seat, making sure that nobody was in my car you know, as I started to drive, I, I still had that sense of fear all the time. I, fear was just a constant companion and the lack of confidence. And, um, but I had activities to do. So that's why I think those activities became so important to me because it was an escape and that was a good escape. It allowed me to feel some emotions that I had not been able to feel. I mean, I felt them, but I, I certainly didn't talk about them out loud. So that's kind of the first step for me was telling and starting to feel like I was back in my body and could have emotions. So I'll talk a little bit more on our next episode about the school relationships that I had, how um, I kind of jumped into a couple of boyfriends in my later high school 
years and how important those relationships were at that time. Um, so my, I guess my words of wisdom are that if you are considering the fact that you have kept your secrets for a really long time or for a really short time, my advice would be find that one person that you know you can trust, that you can ask them to just be quiet and let you divulge your secret to. Because to me, there is such freedom. That's the beginning step in that first piece of grief. It's the pain that you're holding inside. To grieve means to let it out. It, you don't, you, you can't really grieve if you don't let some of those feelings and emotions start to come out. That's how you know that you're in that grieving process and to allow someone else that you trust, that you know will listen to you and tell them, I don't want you to fix me. I don't want you to tell me everything's okay. I just want you to listen. That is really an important step. And for me, and I, I, I believe this is almost true for every survivor of, of any kind of abuse or trauma, it will help you start your healing journey and it will accelerate things once you have a confidant that you can talk to. I hope you have one. If not, come and join Thrive Ivers and share your story with us. Those who have, it has been remarkable for all of us to be listeners, to be witnesses, to be supporters of listening to others and their stories. And for all of us, it's helped us on our healing path. Thanks.